Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, I hope that everyone had a chance to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, perhaps uh, a little history at this point, just uh, before we get started. Uh, the pilgrims who came over were really more exiles than they were uh, pilgrims because uh, I'm not sure how much they teach over here about conditions in England in the 17th century. Now, in the uh, 16th century, uh, the, uh, the nation broke with Rome and the Church of England was formed. And uh, some of the changes, the doctrinal changes uh, introduced in the Reformation were included in this new church. Uh, it followed a more Protestant line. Uh, and, but what it didn't do was free up the church. It uh, basically went from the autocracy of the papacy to the autocracy of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And this was reinforced by the fact that the church is the official church of uh, the nation, that the monarch is the head of that church, the titular head of that church, and that even to this day, seven bishops of the Church of England serve in the House of Lords, which is a legislative body. And so it is this lock between the church and the uh, government, which at that time allowed it to rule as a church in, uh, and uh, it, to exclude other uh, sects of the Christian faith. Uh, Bunyan, who wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, was alive in uh, the late 17th century, and he was in jail, not for writing Pilgrim's Progress, that's where he wrote it, I think. He was in jail for preaching the word. And of course, the one thing that nobody wanted, or the, the thing that, pe that the Church of England de-emphasized was that of grace. Saved by grace, not by works. Because, of course, it sought to preserve itself as an institution, uh, not to serve Christ as a church. Okay, And so you always want the works there. So these people were escaping in 1620, I think, 1620. They were escaping uh, persecution from a Christian, Christian church. And they wanted to uh, worship freely. I also believe that uh, there was some adventurism uh, mixed in with that. Uh, after all, if you weren't the adventurous type, you'd have never got on that ship anyway. So, uh, because not everybody got off it. Uh, and, uh, and plenty of people died that first year. So it was an arduous thing. And perhaps partially uh, showing the desperation uh, or the zeal. Um, for them. But a hundred, over 150 years later, when they wrote the Constitution, they had not forgotten the problem between church and state. And they said there will be no official religion because they knew precisely what that problem was. The fact that there was an official religion would then use the power of the government to uh, be exclusive. Okay. But they never meant the church to be separate from government, that, to, that it, the government was not allowed to, uh, to be involved. There we are. That's, that's what their plans were. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 25. This is where we're going to start. The, uh, the title of this is The Cost of Discipleship. So let's uh, pray before we begin. Father, uh, please uh, be with us uh, through the study of your word, through the precious words of your Son. And let us reach an understanding of uh, his message to us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, there's only been one person who walked on the face of this earth who knew what's going on. What's really going on? Jesus Christ. Yeshua. Because he knew 
what was going on in heaven, and he knows what's going on on earth. Remember when he talks to uh, Nicodemus, he says, you don't believe what I say about when I talk to you about the things on earth. How are you going to believe what, me when I talk to you things about the things in heaven? So Jesus is representative, or, or Jesus knows everything, and so everything he says is absolutely true. Jesus has seen the carnage of souls, the terrible carnage of souls, as the masses pour into hell, bound for, bound for eternal torment. Worse than any war ever. We took all the wars we had had in, on this earth and collected them all together. They don't match even, even a short time of this horrible thing that's going on in heaven. So we, we are here in Luke 14, which is the progress, following the progress of the Lord uh, towards Jerusalem for the Passover, which will also be the crucifixion. And we've been in some pretty rugged territory. Uh, if we look at uh, Luke 13, um, 25 to 27. Luke 13, 25. When once the master of the house has ridden and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at that door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and we taught in your streets, in our, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And then uh, the, the uh, wedding feast, the, the uh, oh sorry, the great, the great banquet, the people who are invited and it says they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field. I must go out and see it. No, you mustn't. You should go to the banquet. That's where you should be. The field, the field can take care of itself. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five oak of your oxen, oxen I, and I go to examine them. No, you don't. That was the wrong answer. By the way, you don't hear them saying, what ban banquet? I wonder how much they knew and how much they were repudiating what they knew. But then again, we are all condemned by the creation of God as uh, revealed in his creation. And so we are all condemned by that. We know. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Cannot come. Yes, you can. Bring her along. So sad. The Lord is calling out, calling out, warning, warning, illustrating. So, just a brief thing about disciples. So who is a disciple? Now, of course, at the beginning, we just had 12 disciples. And then it expanded to 70 or 72, depending on your translation. And then we find other disciples. So, what is a disciple? It is a follower, an adherent, and a student. In fact, we are all disciples. And we are all responsible for behaving in this way and doing these things. So this is us that we're being talked about. Now, it says in verse 25 of Luke 14, it says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. If I just go back with the great crowds, we know that if we have a very large crowd, very likely it's a mixed group. Some people are looking for a miracle, possibly. Some people are just curious. Some people didn't have anything to do. Some people are believers and are listening to every word that's said. And the Lord says, if anyone comes to me 
and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, is even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now we're going to take this gently and slowly because this is a hard saying. The word hate, you can't get around it. The word is the same that is used of God's uh, hate for the disobedient, for the unbelievers, for the wicked. It's uh, a, a pejorative term. So, if you read the commentators, you see various things going on. But, people are saying that it's hyperbole, People say that it's just an illustration. But I began this message by saying that that Jesus is the only one who knows everything that is going on. And we have to be very careful about the words that he uses. We have to be careful. How do we ratify this with love? We are taught to love. Remember, we love with agape love. We have been given we have been given the ability to love with agape love through faith in Christ. No one else can live with truly agape love than the believer in Christ. And everywhere we are told to love our enemies, to love our families, to love our wives. And here he's saying that we might have to hate a wife. Now, in Luke uh, 12... 53, Luke 12, verse 53. This is when he is talking about how he is going to bring division in families. They, and he says, he sums it up by saying, they will be divided, father against son, and son against father, and mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There's one omission here, there's one relationship he doesn't touch with this, and that is the wife. That sacred relationship. So, this can't be the same. It can't be because there's been a breakdown in the relationship. It has to be that it's still a loving relationship. We can't explain it away by saying there's evil in them, so you hate the evil, you love the person, but you hate the evil. We can't, we can't get around this because the wife is in here. So, if we look at the issue of hyperbole, one of the things that is stated by the commentators, that they dismiss this as hyperbole. Well, hyperbole means exaggeration. In fact, it means considerable exaggeration. Well, if if I exaggerate, let's say I'm fishing, 
and I catch this fish, and I say, I catch this fish, I actually caught this fish, I am actually telling a fiction. I'm, I'm not telling the truth. I'm, I'm, not, I'm worried about using hyperbole as an explanation for something that God said, okay? Because nothing that he says is a fiction. Now, if we go to Matthew 18, Matthew 18, verse 7. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you enter a life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, the hell fire. Is that, is that hyperbole? No, I think, it's, I think it's an extreme. I believe that it is so important that you are not attached to something which is going to prevent you from coming to Christ or for serving him properly that you need to cut it away you need to get rid of it whatever it is I know a, a person who is in a relationship which is in a, a sinful relationship they've been in it for a very long time this person has heard the gospel many times and I actually believe it's possible that he cannot embrace it because of the relationship that he's in. Because he knows that that is diametrically opposed to what he... And so he's attached to it. So the very arm that he places around this person and holds onto this person, it would be better if that arm were cut off. Literally, physically cut off if necessary. So I believe that the Lord talks, when he talks about these things, he talks about the very limits of it. And it's not hyperbole, and it's not necessarily an illustration. So going back to this, to this uh, word in uh, Luke... does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, and brothers and sisters, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Everything has to be given up to the Lord. Everything has to be given up. Nothing can be held back. Why would you hold anything back? Because he has given us everything. He is the power and the glory. He is the Christ. I'm centering on the whole issue of wife, not exclusively because I feel this is the most intense and the one, the part of it that's the most challenging. I'm sure most of you have heard of Wormbrand and his book, Tortured for Christ. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a quote. Sabina is his wife, uh, and he is Richard. <clears throat> Sabina Wormbrand reached over and pinched her husband's arm. Richard, she said fiercely, stand up and wash away this shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting on his face. Richard. If I do so, Richard answered, looking intently at his wife, you will use your husband. 
Her eyes bore into his. I don't want a coward for a husband. <laughs> they, <laughs> they sat in a Romanian National Congress on religion shortly after communist soldiers had stormed their country. The assembled Christian pastors, priests, and ministers of all denominations stood one by one and spouted praise to Joseph Stalin and the new communist leadership who had put thousands of Christians in prison already. So Richard stood up to speak. Many were thrilled to see that well-known pastor, that this well-known pastor would join their cause. But instead of praising the communists, he praised Jesus Christ as the only path to salvation. Our first loyalty, he told the gathering, should be to God, not to the communist leaders. The gathering was broadcast live across Romania and thousands across the country heard Richard's challenge. Realizing the damage Richard was doing, communist officials rushed to the stage. Richard escaped out of the back door, but was a hunted man from then on. He would later spend 14 years in prison, and Sabina was in prison as well. I think we're getting close to what Jesus is talking about. Now we know the account of Abraham and Isaac, and when he was told that he had to sacrifice Isaac. What did Abraham do? He got up and went to do it. The knife poised over one of the most precious child's children on the face of the earth, poised, ready to plunge it into his heart. And the angel stopped him. What did Jonathan do? Jonathan helped David. He repudiated his relationship with his father in doing so doing because he knew that David was the anointed. He gave up his birthright of being king for the sake of Christ. But also in the battle against the Philistines, he was with his father and died with his father. So he did not dishonor his father. He honored his father and gave up his life to show that it was right what he did. Let's go to Ezekiel 24. Ezekiel 24, verses 15 through 18. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall you or tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning I did as I was commanded. If you lose a spouse, you will be forced, as a, as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Christ, if you lose a spouse, then you will discover that your real help was from Christ himself. 
that your real protector is him. Remember when David Mitchell was here for the service, remembering Steve. He said that there has been comfort from the Lord in this morning. If you lose a child, what a terrible thing. You know, we lost Steve as our pastor and our friend, our brother. They lost him as their child, their eldest child. But he said there is comfort and the Lord ministers. We don't know why this happened, but it was the purpose of the Lord. Hate. Well, hate. But still the word is there. Still the absolute conviction that what God says is true. Now we could say that it might appear to be hate. We could say that because of our great love for him, everything else appears to be hate. But I think somewhere in here, because you see, hate is not the opposite of love. I believe indifference is the opposite of love. I don't know how to deal with it any further. I can't, I can't advance into this thing any better than I've done so far. And so I have to leave it now. And hope, I believe that somewhere on the extremes, like the arm being chopped off, on the extremes, somebody's going to say, I know why he used that word. And that'll be for their comfort and their confirmation. Then he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now here he mentions the cross even before the crucifixion. And so you might ask, well, will I know my cross in order that I might bear it? I might bear it. Let's go to Luke uh, 9. Twenty-three. Luke nine twenty-three. Here he says it more fully. And he said to all of them, this is verse 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So, if we go to Second Timothy, chapter three, Second Timothy, chapter three, verse twelve. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So your cross will show up if you live for Christ. It is bound to because these two kingdoms are in diametric war, diametrically opposed to one another. And if you start living for the kingdom of heaven, you will run into trouble with the kingdom of earth. And that will be your cross. And you bear it. It'll find you, don't worry. (laughs) 
Now in verse 28 he says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish all, finish, all will see it and begin to mock him. I don't think that I really counted the cost of Christianity in my life because I don't, that wasn't the way I got, I got saved. But I think for some people it is necessary to do that. I do know that we did build a house. Um, Sandra and I did build a house and we didn't count the cost properly and it was standing there unfinished. And I worked for um, a Jewish man uh, in printing, a Jewish man named Aben. And uh, I went up to the plant. I worked in the Philadelphia area and the plant was up in Wilkes-Barre. And I had come up to the plant uh, f- to uh, discuss things and to, fig- uh, to work on some stuff up there. And he said, uh, how's the house coming? And I said, well, it's not finished. And he said, uh, you've run out of money, haven't you? And I said, yes. And so, God bless him. He, uh, he lent us about $30,000. <laughs> he sent down contractors and people to uh, fix it. Uh, I've, uh, Bobby was a, was a tough person to deal with, but, I, but I'd love him to be in heaven. <laughs> He's a very sweet man of doing that. And this, uh, or what king going out to encounter another king in the war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who come against him and with 20,000 with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegna- delegna- delegation and asks for terms of peace. Well, he's talking to this great big crowd and he's thinning the crowd. He's thinning them by this first thing about the hate, about your life, about the cross and the suffering. And he's thinning them by asking them to consider those prices and to consider whether they're willing to pay or not. So if he says, come to me. So if you come to somebody, you turn your back on what you're leaving. And if you follow somebody, then you turn your back as well. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. This is the call of Elisha. And it is verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. That's a pretty heavy plow. That's, they're not messing around here. These people have got money. If they've got, you know, most, most people are dragging a single thing behind one ox, right? 12 yoke. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back for what I have done to you. And he returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, sacrificed them, boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. And when he arose, he went after Elijah and assisted him. You know, the Lord is the only one who can say, come to me. Not just because of his authority, but because he's the only one 
I mean, if I say, come to me, you're going to have a mixed experience. And, but him, with him, there's no mixture. It's all good. It is absolute good. He can say, come to me, and it is in that person's best interests, 100% best interests, to come to him, to follow him. Nothing that he leaves behind is going to compare with what he gains in Christ. Even if he has to lose his life in the first five minutes of his salvation, he has gained more than he can ever gain in any other situation, in any other part of his life. We are all here because we have come to Christ. And he has not disappointed us, ever. We've disappointed him, but not him to us. So I'd like to go back in closing. I'd like to go back to Philippians. And I'd like to start at verse 7 again. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. What a wonderful statement it is. Paul was just hand-picked. He was perfectly picked. And all these people who wanted to continue the traditions and the law, they didn't know the law. They don't really, these people don't truly know what the law is. But he did. And that's why he got it. When he got saved, that's why he got the whole relationship between the law and the grace and free gift of Christ. And he considers that all of that to be rubbish for gaining through and getting a and getting a righteousness that is from him and not from the law. So that concludes our message for today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for every word that you have said to us. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who helps us understand your words and those of your servants and also helps us understand what we should be doing in our lives, who brings us comfort when we need it and brings us discipline when we deserve it. We have come to Christ. We have been drawn by him. And we will never go back. It's in his name we pray. Amen.